Okay, so it looks like we are live on YouTube. So hello everybody, my name is uh, Georgi Bankos. I'm an auditor in the Common Audit Service. Here I have a colleague with me, uh, Xavier Mazuret. He will also help me with the Q&A session after this. Sorry for the technical issues. Okay, I know we are a little bit late, uh, five minutes late and so on. I hope now it works. I see that people are commenting about the technical issues and we already received some questions. So to make it clear, after this, after the introduction, you will watch uh, some recorded videos which were published already last year. And then up to one hour, we will, uh, we will take some questions. I saw already that the questions are pouring in and I see that many of them, they are about Horizon Europe. So please bear in mind that this uh, webinar is related to Horizon 2020. So, Okay, we will try to maybe answer partially the questions about Horizon Europe, but this is not the topic of today. So I would say try to put questions related to Horizon 2020, and I hope that uh, mostly the auditors are, are putting questions today, because today we want to, to honor the CFS auditors. So I don't know. Is the camera it's also new or not? Maybe also to say hello and yes, then... Yes, hello, uh, hello guys. So yes, uh, we will meet uh, after the presentation. I will be uh, happy to, to answer the, the questions on uh, H2020. Okay, so from, my, so from my side, I guess we can start with watching the videos. In the meantime, submit your questions related to Horizon 2020 and also read all the time the questions submitted so far because uh, you know if you have more or less the same question there is no reason to put another question because we are using a lot this like system. Huh? Okay, so thank you very much and uh, see you soon in about uh, 70 minutes. Bye. Dear auditors and friends, welcome. Welcome to this very special training about the certificates on financial statements. My name is Georgi Bankos and I'm a Chartered and Certified Auditor from the Common Audit Service. The Common Audit Service is located in DG RNI Research and Innovation. The, and the Common Audit Service is managing all the second level audits for the Horizon 2020 framework. The purpose of this training is to improve the quality of the certificates financial statements or CFS or we will as we will call them uh, throughout this training. And <clears throat> also the point would be to reduce the possible differences between a CFS and an EC audit. Okay, so let's see what we will discuss today. So the structure of this presentation is the following. First, we will uh, explain what it is the CFS. Then we will look at the most common errors that we found so far until the beginning of 2021 based on the audit results of the EC audits. Then we will look at the main eligibility criteria and the audit procedures for this. So we will cover uh, some procedures which are applicable for all the cost categories, then personal costs, subcontracting and other direct costs. Because this presentation is uh, it's quite long, so it's going to be, I estimate, maybe one hour and a half in total we will split it in three parts. So in the first part, we will cover the introduction, the most common errors and the general procedures. In the second part, it's going to be the personal cost. And in the third part, it's going to be the subcontracting and other direct cost. So let's start. The most important link for you, it's this one where you can find the online manual for the certifications. On this website, you find the template for the CFS, the template for the letter of representation for the CFS, the frequently asked questions, and if you still have further questions, you can raise them to the research inquiry service. Also, you'll find there the links to the grant agreement and to the annotated grant agreement for Horizon 2020. The annotated grant agreement it's a award winning document, which is explaining very clearly all the requirements of the grant agreement with examples and exceptions and so on. 
I also put in the link to the indicative audit program, which the auditors from the Commission and from the external audit firms they are using to perform the second level audits. This may be useful sometimes for you as a source of inspiration when you perform the CFS. But we will talk about this more at a later stage. So we have ex ante controls and ex post controls. In the ex ante controls, we have the certificate on the methodology and we have the large research infrastructure assessments. The ex post controls, they are composed of the CFS, which are the main purpose of this training. And we have the second level audits, which are in fact financial audits and investigation. And they may be launched by the Court of Auditors, by OLAF and by the Common Audit Service by itself or by external audit firms. And for the first level audits for the CFS, the auditor is uh, selected by the beneficiary. For the CFS, the legal basis is Article 20.4 BEE, and there is a threshold of 325,000 euros. In this, we only include the declared actual cost and the unit cost calculated on the basis of the usual cost accounting practice. So this includes the average personal cost and the internal invoice. So the threshold doesn't include the indirect cost and the unit cost, which are calculated like for in the way like we have with flat rates, you know, for the Maris Lodoska Curie actions. Uh, it is required to have a certificate if this threshold is reached per beneficiary at the end of the action and must be submitted by the coordinator within 60 days after the end of the last reporting period. The certificate may cover the whole action or each reporting period separately. The CFS costs are eligible under the category cost for goods and services. The CFS is not an insurer assurance engagement, but an agreed upon procedures engagement. The auditors which they perform the CFS, they must be qualified auditors in accordance with this uh, Directive 43 from 2006. They must be independent and they must comply with the Code of Ethics for the professional accountants. However, there are two exceptions. For public bodies, they may use an independent public officer with formal competence to audit and international organization, they may appoint an internal or external auditor in accordance with its internal financial regulations and procedures. If you want to go straight to see the template for the CFS, you find it in this uh, link above. And inside you will see that uh, in the template, it, you have two big parts, the terms of reference and the independent report of factual findings. So the terms of reference, it's a contract signed by the authorized representatives of the beneficiary or the linked third party and the auditor. In the independent report of factual findings is the report completed by the auditor, which includes a table of specific details to be verified as instructed by the European Commission. Now we get into more details what you find in the terms of reference. So this is the engagement of the auditor by the beneficiary. It's clarified the subject of the engagement, like the project, the cost audited, the responsibilities of the beneficiary and of the auditor, the applicable standards, the reporting, the timing, other terms like fees, liability, applicable law. And of course, we have the date and signature of the auditor and beneficiary. In the auditor's independent report, we find 66 procedures covering all cost categories. For each of these procedures, the auditor needs to complete in the table C for confirm, meaning it is complying with what they need to check. There is an exception and then they need to, to explain the exception. And of course, the confirmation or the exception, they need to be based on the audit work and oral representations are not enough. And in case, for example, the beneficiary doesn't declare equipment costs, then of course the tests for uh, equipment are not applicable. So if that's the case, they will need to, to write not applicable for that section and to, to explain why. This also contains further remarks 
and of course this report is confidential and it should be used by the beneficiary and the commission agency only. There is also confirmation of no conflict of interest and it is mentioned the fee that it was paid and we also have a signature of the auditor. So let's look at the key differences between the CFS and the EC audits. So the CFS is the so-called first level audit and the EC audits are the second level audits. The CFS is an agreed upon procedures, while the EC audits are assurance engagement. Therefore, which means that for the CFS, the auditor is not responsible for the suitability and pertinence of the procedures because they are set up by the commission. While for the EC audits, there is an indicative audit program. However, the auditor remains the, the owner of the audit work and they can tailor the procedures performed. Um, the, another difference is that in the EC audits, we are also looking at the um, internal control system and this may lead to system recommendation, which is not the case for CFS. So this is not included in a, in a CFS. As already mentioned, like the EC audits, they can be performed by the commission itself or by external audit firms appointed by the commission. While the CFS, it is performed by auditors which are selected by the beneficiary. It is also different method, you know, how to, to select this. So for the EC audits, we use a monitor unique sampling method and we top it off with a risk-based selection. While for the CFS, it is required to do a CFS when the threshold is reached. And due to these differences, the CFS doesn't lead to extrapolation, while the EC audits, they may lead to extrapolation of systemic and recurrent findings uh, found in them. However, there are also similarities. So both of the tools, they are ex post controls they pro that provide assurance to the authorizing officer on the eligibility of cost claim in the financial statements. The procedures between the two, they are quite similar. Therefore, also the documentation is quite similar. However, there are differences. So, for example, in the EC audits, we also have physical inspection for equipment. We are looking for the EU logo, for the JU logo, and we have interviews with some of the persons declared in personal cost. This is not the case with these procedures for the CFS. If, for example, you have a project with um, three periods and two are audited by the EC audits, then only the third period it should be included in the threshold for the CFS submission. So it may be that no CFS is required anymore. OK, so that was the introduction, what it is the CFS. Now we will look at the most common errors that we found so far based on the EC audits until beginning of 2021. So as you can see here, we have more or less almost 1,300 audits close so far with almost 3,000 participation. So even though these numbers, they, they are big numbers, you need to bear in mind that this is around 33% of the multi-annual goal for the Horizon 2020 audit strategy. What, so what you will find in this, uh, in the next slide. So we have here only the negative adjustment because uh, it is considered that positive adjustment are not considered errors for this purpose. Also the adjustments related to indirect costs are excluded because they are just a flat rate. And also we removed the reclassifications between cost categories to be easier to, to look at the errors. As you would expect, most of the errors, they are in personal costs because this is the cost category where most of the costs are claimed. If you look here in total, in actual cost and in unit cost, we have only around almost 70% of the errors. Uh, I was following this type of presentation, you know, from some time and I have seen that uh, during the time, like the percentage of errors in personal cost has increased. You can see that it's more errors in actual cost than in unit cost. This is for two main reasons. 
on one side the unit cost is much less used and on the other side it's used the unit cost for uh, mostly big beneficiaries with a lot of projects and they use the same methodology for um, for all the cost um, declared you know so they know very well why they are doing so that's one of the reason why the the errors are smaller but let's look first at the actual cost so as you would expect there are three main areas where you can have errors you can have issues with the productive hours you can have issues with the Renumeration cost, which is basically the pool of costs, which is based, you know, the calculation for the hourly rate calculation. And then you may have issues with the time claim or with the time sheets, depends how you want to call it. So, of course, you may miss some uh, supporting documents and uh, there may be also issues with double, fun double funding. You see that there is quite a big portion of other errors, which, okay, it's, it was many of them with small percentages. So, I didn't list them. If we look at unit cost, we see another type of error, which is that uh, indirect costs were claimed as direct costs. Let's see what's next. Next is subcontracting. Here we have, you see, 8% of uh, errors. And uh, this is a more risky area because even though in subcontracting it is not so many costs declared, Statistically, when we have errors, they are big errors because, for example, if there is an issue with the best value for money or if the costs were not foreseen in Annex 1 nor agreed by the EU services or you are missing the documents, for example, then you will need to reject the, the whole cost item, which it can be quite big. So it's not like for personal costs that you make an adjustment for some hours or for you know, some differences in the productive time calculation. Then in the other uh, cost, which okay, we will look at them like split in other direct goods and services, which is okay, let's say mostly consumables. Then we will look at the equipment and the travel. So you will see that it's more or less the same um, type of errors, like lack of documents, cost not related to the action, or no direct measurement. So you see in equipment almost 5% of the errors and in travel around 2% of the errors, more or less the same source of errors. And in the meantime, the largest research infrastructure errors, they, they were significant enough to, to make sense to present them uh, separately. Okay, so this was the part about the most common errors that we found so far. The purpose of presenting that would be to, to help you to draw your attention to the more risky areas in the CFS. Now we will look at some general procedures which are applicable for all the cost categories. We will have a couple of slides dealing with the planning of the work, about the information requests, so the type of documents that you are using. It's going to be a very important discussion about the sample selection and then we will list the general eligibility criteria in the main type of audit tests. So let's see what type of documents are you requesting and what are you using to perform a CFS. So you will need a breakdown per reporting period with reference to financial years for each category of personal costs, which would mean, for example, like uh, employees, natural persons and so on. Then you will need for them the details for basic remuneration, complements and additional remuneration, the hourly rates calculation policy, then, and then other policies like remuneration practices, usual cost accounting, procurement policy, travel policy, and of course the accounting records. What else? As George Clooney is saying, you will look at the time recording system with some examples in the, you know, before you do the actual work and then you will review them in detail. You look at contracts, you will schedule meetings with the human resources, payroll, accounting, departments, time recording. And then, okay, you will do also some uh, payments tests, you know, you will look at pay slips, payroll, bank statements and contracts, for example. Now let's get to one of the most important parts, so that's the sample selection. So you see the sample, it's selected for 
each subcategory of costs and it should be randomly selected as it so that it is representative. If you have a population smaller than 10 items, then you need to test all the items. If you have more than 10 items, you still need to test at least 10 people or items or 10% of the total number of items, so whichever number is the highest. So this is also one of the reasons why it may appear differences between the EC audits and the CFS audits, because the sampling methodology is not the same, and even if the methodology would be the same, due to this random nature of how we select the samples, it may be that it was not the same items included in the sample, even if it's the same methodology. And then on top for the EC audits, the procedures, I think they are more detailed. We go in more deep when we do this audit, so it's possible that we find more errors than they were found in the CFS. Okay, so now let's start with the general important things. So first we list uh, ineligible items. So all, all costs declared should not include these things like costs related to return on capital, debt and debt service charges, provisions for future losses or debts, interest on doubtful debts, currency exchange losses, bank charges for incoming EU funds. Also, deductible VAT should not be included. Therefore, okay, you will look at the cost claim and you will look at the national law, tax declaration, the accounting system of the beneficiary. If you find e issues, you will need to, to address them. And here I would like to explain what it means adjustments on this slide. So as far as I understand, when you do a CFS, first the beneficiary say, look, this is what I have declared or this is what I want to declare. You do your audit work and then you see, look, I found these issues. And then the beneficiary normally it's adjusting the claim to only declare what it is eligible. And therefore, many times in the CFS, we don't have exceptions because the beneficiary adjusted the, the issues. So here adjustments, it's meant in the sense that you need to address these points or if the beneficiary doesn't want to adjustment, adjust them, you would need to uh, explain them as exceptions. Another general eligibility condition is that costs are actually incurred. Therefore, for this purpose, so you will look at uh, various documents like invoices, you look at the accounting records like the general ledger, and you will check that, okay, they included all the discounts, all the rebates, that the costs are paid or netted off. And if there are issues, you need to address them. Another generally general eligibility condition is that cost claim need to fall within the project period. For this purpose, you will check invoices, delivery notes, transport documents, and you will need to pay special attention with the costs declared before the project periods because they may be related to kickoff kick meeting, so then they are um, still eligible, or they may relate to the final reporting when they are still also eligible. So overall here you will look in the accounting records more or less and address the differences. Another general eligibility condition is that the beneficiary needs to comply with the national accounting standards and any digital documents, if they are used, must be allowed by the national law. So for this purpose, you will review the national law and the documents that you receive, and you may find interesting to review also the statutory audit reports to see if you find any relevant findings. This part is about the personal cost. We will cover the main eligibility criteria and the audit procedures. It is a lot to cover, but OK, this is just a short summary. So here you can see the main uh, the main points that we'll talk about. So workforce contracts, natural persons, time recording, hourly rates, productive hours, double ceiling, consistency. You'll see what consistency do I mean? and also some bonus things, especially for you for today. It's about 45 slides, so I will go quite quickly on them and uh, 
Just say I will try sometimes to to mention some things which are not on the slides or some things which are not so obvious. Let's say. So the first thing that you need to master is to you know to be comfortable. You know where you classify the work for contracts because you see depending on the answers to this question questions on this slide like you know if it's an employment contract or not if it's with a person or with a company you know or, you know where the people work you know or how many contracts they have <clears throat> then based on this let's say the contract may be eligible under personal cost under subcontracting or under other goods and services you know so this is a very important topic so what you can claim in personal cost? So of course, you can claim the employees, you know, uh, but you can also claim natural persons provided that they work under similar conditions to that of an employee, that the results of work belong to the beneficiary and that the costs are not significantly different for those of an employee. In 2017, it was a slight change in the wording to allow to be eligible for the Coco Co and the Coco Pro contracts for from Italy and okay, similar contracts in other countries. Okay, also other case that it can be claimed other personal cost, but it must be set in Annex 1. It's employees of a third party seconded to the beneficiary. So now let's see what you cannot claim. So of course, if some of these conditions is not fulfilled, then OK, it's not personal cost, it's something else. It's other uh, goods and services or subcontracting. So you may have issues with the hourly rates or where are the people working or that the conditions are not similar or the contracts it's you see with a uh, with a company, not with an. Uh, not with a natural person. Also, if they were very independent, more like a subcontractor, and they are paid for deliverables that rather than working time. Again, it's not for personal cost, but it is for the other two cost categories. Now let's switch to the next point, the time records. First, let's bear in mind which are the main issues which may appear, you know, with the time records. So you may find inconsistencies with the human records records and the time records like here we are talking about the holidays, um, work related, travel and sick leave. Then it may be that the minimum requirements for timesheets are not fulfilled or you may have issues with the double ceiling. On the next slides, we will explain what it is this double ceiling about. OK, it's exactly the next slide. So this is very important because there are two double ceiling. One it's on the hours. You see that the total number of hours declared in EU and URATON grants for a person for a year should not be higher than the number of annual productive time hours used for the calculation of the hourly rate. And then it's the same check, but on the cost, not on the hours. In the CFS procedure, this, this is not, you know, directly mentioned that you need to check it, but it's mentioned that Basically, the costs are complying, you know, with certain articles. And if you read these articles in the grant agreement, you see that it also, you know, it's also about this uh, double ceiling. So just be sure that you verify this thing because it may have serious impact for your um, for your CFS audit. OK, so which are the minimum requirements for the timesheet? So you see, you need to have in the timesheets the title and number of the action, the beneficiary full name, full name, date and signature of the person working for the action, the number of hours work for the action, the supervisor full name and signature, and the reference to the action task and work packages. And in addition, the timesheets, they need to match with the records of annual leave, sick leave, other leaves and work related travel. So there are two options how to um, to keep time records. You have the timesheets and you have also this declaration of exclusive work, which can be used, you know, if you have at least covered inside one calendar month and up to one period, and you can only use one declaration per period. So if you use the declaration for a couple of months and you still have time in your period, then 
to timesheets. If you don't want to lose the hours, it's beneficiary when you declare the cost. This is an example. How does it look like? The declaration of um, exclusive work for the action is more or less like a timesheet, but you know you don't have the hours detail per day or per month. This is very important to bear in mind because, in fact, declaration of exclusive work for the action for you know some beneficiaries they interpreted it. So if you have somebody which or who, in fact, correctly. So, so somebody who doesn't work on other action, like their interpretation was that, uh, you know, so they can use the declaration, but this is not correct because the interpretation is that, or not interpretation, this is what written there, is that they don't need to have other activities, you know. So you need to be careful, you know, if there is evidence that they had lectures, unforeseen travel, writing proposals, or you know, doing other stuff, you know, which may be not declared on another project, you know. So this is very important for you to to bear in mind. Here, just to recap the the procedures, you know, for the time recording system. So you see, probably you'll have meetings, walk through tests, you will review the documents, you will look at the formal criteria and uh, this thing with the matching with the um, HR records. And also you need to bear in mind the evidence for the double ceiling, which you also need to review. Pam, pam. This slide is very nice because it's kind of giving you a flavor of, let's say, what it is in the menu, how the beneficiary can declare costs. So you see they can use actual cost, average cost, and then, OK, for the SME owners, it's also kind of uh, it's unit cost, but it's set up by the commission. Then if you use actual cost, you have the option between project based remuneration and non project based. And the concept of additional remuneration, it exists only for project based remuneration. And OK, this may be eligible or not, and there is also a cap to it. But in the most used case, like the non-project based enumeration, there is the option to calculate monthly rates or annual rates. And then there are three options for the productive time, 17, 20 hours per year, individual productive time and standard productive time. <clears throat> but OK, the individual productive time, you will see it's not available if monthly rates are used. So which is the general and also the compulsory formula to calculate the hourly rates? So you have the hours worked, which are coming from the time records, multiplied by the hourly rate, which is OK based on these calculations that we will see. And then you can add on top the additional remuneration, but only if you are a non-for-profit uh, organization. Here, OK, it's again listed the same thing. Uh, bear in mind that it's not in the scope of the CFS, the SME owner without a salary, because that those are flat rates set up by the commission. Here it's explained how this is calculated, but as I said, it's not in your scope. This is not, uh, it's more just for your information, you know. But I kept it here because you may have a situation that you have an SME owner or a natural person, which for some period they don't receive a salary. So then they use the unit cost, which is not in the scope of your CFS, but then they may switch to have a salary. And then you may, you know, still have SME owners or natural persons which are included in the, in the CFS. <clears throat> About unit cost. So this is a, a very important topic and here it's also something very interesting to mention, like uh, when we do the comparison, um, let's say EC audits and uh, CFS audits. So first about the Unico. So why, what are these things, you know? So here the hourly rate is calculating according to the usual cost accounting practice, provided that okay, we have these three big conditions. It is applied in a consistent manner based on objective criteria, and regardless of the source of funding. 
It is calculated using the actual personal cost recorded in the accounts, excluding ineligible costs or included in other budget categories. It is used one of the options to determine the annual productive hours provided in the grant agreement. So this is the nice story. You will see that uh, this approach is used not so often, mostly by very big beneficiaries, which they know what they are doing. But here, the key word is that you see this approach, it needs to be applied regardless of the source of funding. So this means that it should not be applied only for EU actions. And for EC audits, what the indicative audit program is saying that we need to pick up, you know, five projects, not EU projects in which we need to check that the beneficiary used this unit cost also there, you know. But uh, <clears throat> in the CFS, this is not included, but I just told you that as an aspiration. And in the CFS at the at section A3 with the hourly rates, so it is said that if the beneficiary has a COMUC, then you kind of need to declare that they apply this unit cost in all the projects, so regardless the source of funding. But if they don't have a COMUC, the wording is relating only to the recalculation of the rates for the project that you are auditing. And then if you look at the first part, like in A1 with the personal cost and at the part with unit cost, there it is mentioned that um, you know they were applied consistency for horizon 2020 projects so it appears there are uh, let's say some differences here between the ec audits and the cfs i would say it's normal because the, the scope and the, the usage of this is different so let's see the next part Now we have the formulas. How do we calculate the hourly rates in the general case or in the specific case with project based remuneration? <clears throat> so you see in the general case, we have total personal cost divided by total productive hours. And then this rate is going to be applied to all the projects that they are you know, declaring cost for us. Uh, in the specific case, we look at the hours per action and also the personal costs only for that action. So you see, this is a very important step when you need to decide are you in case 1A or 1B, like in the general or in the specific case. So then you may ask yourself, look, in which situation I am? And the answer it's uh, it's quite easy. So if the remuneration for time worked in some projects is different than the remuneration for other duties, then you are in the specific case. What does this mean is that so when you see that the remuneration of a person is changing, if he's working in a project or not, it means that you are in the project based remuneration. So how they can do this? So they may have supplementary employment contracts to work in a specific projects, a bonus or a premium for the time worked in a project, or that uh, you, they would have a specific hourly rate, you know, for working in uh, specific projects. Now we get back to the hourly rates calculation. So you see you have two options like the annual calculation or the monthly calculation. The monthly calculation was introduced later in the program from 2016. Here it's a slide summarizing what they can include in the personal cost. So salaries and social charges of the employers and various taxes related to personal cost. And they need to exclude the ineligible items which we listed in uh, part one of this training in the general procedures and they also need to exclude costs included in other cost categories like indirect costs and this is more important especially for the average cost for the unit cost because there it may be that they also include some cost of indirect cost nature it's more likely or probable 
For the calculation of <coughs> productive hours, there are three options. So we have the 1720, which is a new option compared to FP7. And this they, might they must use it if the employment contract does not specify the working time or if the annual workable hours cannot be determined. Then they can also choose the individual annual productive hours. So here you have the annual workable hours and you add the overtime and the absences. And you have also the option of standard annual productive hours, which must be according to the beneficiary's usual accounting practices. And here there is, however, a minimum threshold. So the annual productive hours, they must be at least higher than 90% of the standard annual workable hours. So you need to bear in mind that even though the CFS, it's assuming that okay, most beneficiaries, they only use one of the options for productive hours, that in fact, in reality, the beneficiary may do a mix of them or they may use more options in the same time, but they need to, to make a differentiation in the sense that the same option must be applied to all personal working in Horizon 2020 actions, provided that you see that the same option is applied at least per group of personnel employed under similar conditions, like you see same staff category, call center, same type of contract. And they also need to apply the options consistently, you know, so they cannot change it as they want, you know, depending if they get more money or not. And they need to keep the same options, the same approach for a financial year or a fiscal year, because, you know, the beneficiary, they can choose, OK, if they want to use the financial year or the fiscal year as the basis. So anyway, we'll talk more about this in the next slides. So if you look in the CFS, you will see that uh, you have kind of option A, B, C, but in the grant agreement, we refer to option one, two, three. So here you have the two, two types of wording. So here are some comments about the productive hours. So the first one, the option A doesn't need to be supported. It can just be used, you could say, for free. And it's in their favor if they do a pro rata when somebody is not working full time or the full year. Then for the individual annual productive hours, the formula is mandatory. So what does this mean? That they cannot, you know, deduct or add other things here in addition to the absences and overtime, you know, and this must be also supported. So it's not allowed to kind of do something, in fact, like the option C, but at the individual level. So this is not allowed for Horizon 2020. It's part of the simplification measures. So I guess that's maybe one of the reasons why we have sometimes these issues with the productive time. And then for the last option, the standard annual productive hour. So this must be calculated overall for the beneficiary or as explained here before, you see per staff category, type of contract and, and call center. <coughs> um, as far as I have seen in the CFS in the section about uh, productive hours, which is I think A2, so it's not too much mentioned about the consistent application of the options for productive hours per staff category or type in all the actions in the same financial year. But this is something important and you need to bear in mind. I believe that was the case because the template, it's kind of, uh, let's say, assuming that they will only use one option. So kind of that consistency, it's ensured from the beginning. Then here it's a reminder that option two is not allowed for the monthly hourly rate. So that's very important because some beneficiaries, they did this mistake. And then for option three, the CFS procedures, they are telling you to verify the consistency with the usual cost accounting practice. Uh, in the EC audits, we are checking this by looking in five non-EU actions, but in the CFS, this, this is left at the discretion and at the professional judgment of the auditor. So, okay, bear this in mind. Here is a very nice slide summarizing how we calculate the hourly rates. 
when the annual rates are used. So you see here that if in the reporting period you have a part of a calendar year or financial year which is not closed yet, so in this case the three months for, from 2021, so they need to use for that period the rate of 2020, which was closed. About the monthly rates, so as you would expect, you take the annual productive hours and you divide them by 12. It's not allowed for them to use option two for the productive time or option B. And if they have some bonuses or certain salaries and similar things, so they uh, they must be pro rata, you know, so they cannot include them in the month that they were paid in, in full amount. And then it's a very interesting point, this part with the time spent in parental leave, how can you deal with it? And if you want to see this, look in the annotating model, the grant agreement, because you find a very well explained example. So I will not spend time on this uh, here in this presentation. Uh, so also in the CFS, in the third part about um, the rates, the hourly rates, uh, you need to you will see that you need to check the consistency, you know, of application that they, you know, that they kept the correct option in the same financial year of annual or monthly rates. But in the EC audits, we go a little bit further. So okay, bear in mind this consistency because it's it's very important, even though. Maybe it's not so much emphasis of it in, in the CFS procedures. This is a very nice slide <coughs> summarizing, you know, the differences you see below <coughs> between basic renumeration and additional renumeration, and then when certain bonuses they are ineligible. And this slide, in fact, may explain why many beneficiaries they did not uh, you know tap into the additional remuneration because even though they used project-based remuneration so they didn't go you know you could say to the dark side and use the additional remuneration because you see in order to be eligible this needs to be used not just by eu action you know so many times this was quite possible to explain that look, we have national projects, we pay this amount, and then we have other type of project which are not only EU actions, and here we pay more, you know, so this was not the reality, so then they didn't use this. But okay, we will go into more detail about uh, project-based remuneration here. So here we have an example. <clears throat> You see somebody has a fixed salary contract, a family allowance, and then, an, okay, this is 100 euros per month. And then if they work in funded projects, they receive 1000 euros more per month. So here it means that we are in project based enumeration. Here are the steps, you know, how, how you need to do these calculations. Also, when you do your checks, but okay, you can read this and anyway, we will uh, see them better in the example. And by the way, also this approach was introduced from 2017. So in before it was another definition for the additional remuneration. So with a new definition, additional remuneration means any part of the remuneration which exceeds what the person would be paid for time worth in projects funded by national schemes. And you can find in the grant agreement what it means national schemes, in fact. And this is only eligible for non-profit legal entities. This slide is very important and also I want to mention that uh, in the CFS procedures, it is included that you need to check the consistency, you know, that they paid this, this additional enumeration, but basically it's nothing really linked to the, to the base core of this eligibility criteria. Like you see, in order to be eligible, it needs to be paid at least once before the submission of the proposal 
to any employee, I would say any employee in that category, because many times you have some internal rules or laws, you know, which they explain this by type of staff, by category of staff. So additional remuneration may be explained in national law or internal rules. You know, so be sure that you check this thing. If these are not available, then there is a fallback option, which many times is not so interesting, but still it's better to have something. So then they can calculate the rates using the average of the salary of the person for the previous year, excluding remuneration and time work for the Horizon 2020 action. So basically they are, let's say, trying to determine, you could say, an average rate they use for projects, but by cleaning them out of the Horizon 2020 action. So to kind of to see what they would pay, you know, in other actions, but not Horizon 2020 actions. And this slide is summarizing <coughs> how some internal rules should be set up in order for um, for them to to make this cost eligible so the internal rules they need to say who can get the extra remuneration meaning which person or staff category how much they will get you know in which conditions like what has to happen for them to get the remuneration like look to work in a project and so on uh, but bear in mind that it cannot apply only to eu actions huh? Now we have some examples of good or not so good internal rules. You see that, let's read this. The director may decide an extra payment for any member of staff participating in project. So this is not good because this is not an objective condition. And in this case, the extra remuneration would be not eligible. Then, in the other situation, any researcher participating in projects receiving external funds will get an extra remuneration of 20% of its salary. So this is good, but you need to be careful on one point, that if the extra remuneration is the same regardless of the number of hours worked in the project, then you would need to kind of do a prorata, you know, to see you see, to, to divide by all the hours worked by the person, project, and on project work to, to calculate which is the eligible part. <clears throat> now let's see also some good examples. Like any professor participating in a research project in receiving external funds, we get 10 euros extra per hour worked in the project. So here we know who will get how much and when, you know, so here we are all good. We do not have internal rules for the bonuses, but we always pay the same bonuses in same circumstances. So this is an example from real life. It, it happens many times, this type of uh, reactions from the beneficiary. But if it's like that, you know, they should write it, you know, and it means that, you know, they should have some internal rules on this. So I hope that you will not see this situation too much. Now we have an example to better grasp these, these concepts. So you see we have Mr. T with basic salary, a fixed complement, and then you have these uh, variable components depending on the participation in research projects, you know. And these are included in the internal rules of the entity. So she received the uh, in thousand euros and she worked 800 hours in in detection they use 70 20 as productive hours and they use annual rates so, okay it's not the the worst scenario let's say so let's see some calculations but before you see we need to look in the internal rules and we also need to look you know how much the entity has paid in past for work in national projects so here we add more information in the examples that uh, let's assume that they may get up to 2,500 extra per month of full dedication. But you see in reality, they only paid 
okay, 1433 per month, you know. So that's coming back, you know, to that slide that I said is very important that it needs to be paid once before the submission of the project proposal. So here, if we do the math, we can see that, you know, that uh, this person received more, so that's the action reference, 27.5, than the national reference. And the national reference is calculated based only on the amount actually paid. So you see you have the two rates and then it is this calculation showing how much is the additional remuneration. So now we need to see, so how much is the basic? So we apply the rate from the national projects to the hours declared. We obtain this amount and then we need to see how much it's eligible as additional remuneration because there is this cap of 8,000 euros per year of full-time equivalent and this includes you know, salary and all the taxes and social charges and so on. So you see here, if you are not, if you are for profit, the additional enumeration is not eligible, so you just get the basic enumeration. But if you are a non-profit entity, then we need to look, okay, at the, at the ceiling with the 8,000 per year and also we need to see how much was actually paid, you see. So here we can see that not the full amount that was paid is eligible, you know. So here you, you see all the, all the details of these calculations. This is the last slide of this, uh, this uh, part of the presentation. This is about the seconded personnel from third parties. Okay, here against payment, but they may be also provide it for free. And this slide is summarizing kind of the main things that you will need to check in order to perform the, the procedures from the CFS. So you will, uh, you know, review the secondment contracts or other equivalent documentations like decision engagement letters and so on. And you will need to see that the seconded personnel worked for the beneficiary and in what conditions and special attention must be made to the clause that persons are at the disposal of the beneficiary. This is the third part of this training, and here we will talk about subcontracting costs and other direct costs. This, this, pres like this part of the presentation is not going to be so long. We will not enter too much in the audit procedures because already the Procedures from the CFS, they are quite clear. So I guess we will discuss more about the eligibility criteria. So let's see first what it is in the menu, to put it like that, for the subcontracting cost. So which are the important points for this topic? So it's the best value for money or the lowest price principle. Then with the approach towards contracting authorities, and we also have some very good slides about the third parties types. So on this slide, I, I try to summarize which are the main things that you need to check uh, for the subcontracting cost. So of course, you need to obtain the documents to see that there are some contracts and they are signed and you need to verify this you know, with the other documents and you need to check the formal requirements of the tendering procedure. Also, you need to check that the cost claimed in subcontract was foreseen in Annex 1 of the grant agreement and that subcontracts were not awarded to other beneficiaries of the consortium. There are also other things to check, so please refer to the CFS procedures. And as usual, if there are problems, you need to address this. And if it's only formal requirements, normally the, the costs are not necessarily not eligible, but you still need to, to raise this as an exception. Then about the contracting authority. So if the beneficiary is a contracting authority or a contracting entity within the meaning of this directive, like 17 from 2004 or 18 from 2004, then 
normally they have more uh, detailed procedure and more strict and you need to check that their procurement approach was compliant with the national law of procurement. For the other beneficiaries, you will need to check, you know, that they comply with their usual accounting practice, their normal procurement procedures. And in all cases, so you will need to kind of reperform the work to check the, the procedures that they performed. On this slide, we, we start to talk about third parties, and as you can see, there are more types of third parties. So we can have subcontractors, we can have linked third parties, or we can have third parties provided in-kind contributions. These may be goods, services, and works. The other information on this slide is more relevant for the EC audits because there we are also checking if the beneficiary ensure this access, you know, for the Commission, OLAF, and the Court of Auditors, but this is not found in the in the CFS procedures. And also during the normal EC audits, there are special procedures if we are auditing a, a linked third party. But this was the introduction for this slide, which is very nice. This is a summary of the types of third parties, which many times I was joking that it's it's a good poster because you know it's so useful. So here, for example, you can see that for subcontractors. There is no indirect cost applied, and then for the others, this is applied. Then um, for subcontractors and contractors, you are claiming the, the cost, while, for example, for linked third parties, uh, so that was the price, but for linked third parties, it is the cost, you know. And here you have the explanation, so what it is a linked third party. So it's an affiliated entity, or you have a legal link with it, I mean, the beneficiary. And then for subcontractors and the contractors, which are claimed in uh, other direct cost, it's applicable the, the same principle with the best value for mine, money and the avoidance of conflict of interest. Okay, so let's let's go to the next slide. Well, this slide is very good as a summarizing of the types of uh, third parties and we will go back a little bit to some of these concepts also when we start to talk about the uh, other direct costs. It's a special focus on the linked third parties because um, for this type of third parties it's very important that they are mentioned in the grant agreement. If not, they are not eligible because for subcontracting and you could say normal third parties, there is in place also this uh, so-called light approval procedure. So even if they were not in the annex of the grant agreement, they may be described in the technical reports. And if the commission approves those technical reports and they pay, it means they are approved. But for linked third parties, this is not applicable. So pay special attention to them. Also about affiliated entities. So in case there is subcontracting to affiliated entities, first you need to check that this is the usual supplier or there is a framework contract, but still, and this is very important, that the subcontracting is carried out at marking conditions, you know, so they still need to comply with the best value for money principle. Now we already switched to other direct costs, so here it's more uh, points that we will deal. The most important uh, topic that we'll cover in more detail is the direct measurement of cost or you know, the recording of usage or consumption. Then for equipment, it's important to remember that useful life may be different than the project duration for equipments. And then again, the best value for money principle and Again, reminder about what happens if you are a contracting authority. And last, at the end of this episode, it's uh, the travel cost, which we like very much. So let's approach the direct cost. So here we look at the definition. So what are the direct costs? These are costs directly linked to the actions implementation and can be attributed to it directly. They must not include indirect costs. Uh, direct costs have been caused in full by the action or are costs that have been caused in full by several actions and then attribution to a single action can and has been directly measured. 
Uh, as you have seen, uh, the beginning of the most common errors, it was like in these sections, like subcontracting and then the other direct cost. Most of the errors were related to this thing with the direct measurement and the allocation to the to the unit to the action, or it was issues with the um, let's say missing documents. So in the end, they are all kind of related, or they are maybe very similar. You know, so these are some reminders. It's important to be able to check these things. If not, uh, you will find ineligible cost. So you see, it's important for the beneficiary to have enough evidence to justify this direct link, to have them recorded in the accounting records. It's very important to be able to quantify the cost and they need to ensure this direct measurement, which doesn't mean proxies, cost drivers or allocation keys. You know. So what you find that they don't comply with this thing, it means that they are not eligible and they are covered by the flat rate for indirect cost, which is 25%. Let's see here some examples. So this is an equipment and we will slowly start to talk about the equipment cost. So you see we have an X-ray for an action that is used a few hours and then for the rest of the time the machine is used for other activities. The beneficiary charges the full depreciation cost for the period in the cost statement of the action. But you see this is uh, not allowed because the allocation of the part of the annual depreciation to the Horizon 2020 action must be calculated based on the number of hours, days of months of actual use of the equipment for the action. And the actual use must be also directly measured, like you see through logbooks or other means. And then I'm coming back to the introduction, like. Also, you need to be very careful at which is the useful life of the equipment because many times the beneficiaries, they may say, look, the useful life is the project duration, but that's not true in all the situations. So it may be that there is also an issue with the useful life when you calculate the depreciation, not just an issue with the direct measurement. So now we continue with the equipment. So if you have situation when you know some assets are sold or offered, we are also checking that there is not undeclared profits. So of course, you look at the accounting records. If these are offered assets, they will be in Annex 1 as income contributions and it should not include estimates and they should charge only the costs. Then the main uh, procedure for equipment is to um, recalculate the depreciation. This must be in accordance with accounting standard, with the national law, and it needs to be on a cruel basis. So even if the beneficiary is using cash basis for the EU funds, they still need to calculate the depreciation on a cruel basis. And of course, they need to only charge the part related to the period of the action. And here again, the, the useful life of the asset may be relevant. And now the um, depreciation is calculated based on the full usage principle. At the beginning, it was used the full capacity principle. So just to give you an example, so you can see the difference between the two. So with the, fuel, the, with the full usage principle, <clears throat> let's imagine that you have an asset which is used one day in a year for one action and then another day for another action. So with the full usage principle, you could charge, you see, to one of the action 50% of the depreciation of that asset. But with the full capacity, you would say, look, I can only charge one day out of the 365 days per year of the asset. So this may make quite a difference. So. It's very important for this, the way that the beneficiary is uh, keeping track of the usage and the consumption for consumables, okay, usage for equipment. Also for equipment, the beneficiary and also for the consumables, if they are higher value, the beneficiary must demonstrate the best value for money. You know, So this is not just for subcontracting, as some uh, beneficiaries may think. You know. So for this, you need to follow their uh, usual practice, their normal procedure or 
if it's a contracting authority, they need to comply with the national law. And here I listed some uh, usual mistakes that because they named the supplier in the grant, they were thinking that they don't need to demonstrate the best value for money anymore. And so in principle, we accept the beneficiary practice, but when we see, look, that they don't make sense, like to give you an extreme example, like you say, look, below 1 million, we don't ask free offers, for example. So we'll say, okay, that's that doesn't make sense, you know. And here again, reminder that uh, we still need to calculate depreciation, even if they use cash basis. So we also need to look at the procurement for the equipment in order to check that their, their cost, you know, is sound financial management compliant or best value for money compliant. And here we look at uh, in more levels, like if they have internal rules, we check those. If they don't have internal rules, we look at the usual practice or the approach that they have taken. If not, we are checking whatever persuasive justification they may provide to, to justify compliance with these two, with these two principles. If they are a contracting authorities also for equipment, they need to, to comply with the national law on procurement for this. So the same as for subcontracting. Now let's switch to consumables. So here again, it's very important the uh, direct measurement and to be able to quantify this cost, you know. So here in this example, the total consumable cost are charged as direct cost on the Horizon 2020 action as proportion of the action hours to total worked hours in the laboratory. So as I already said, this is not allowed because this is an approximation, is a proxy, is a cost driver. So even if the usual accounting practice of a beneficiary is to consider laboratory consumables as direct cost, they need to be measured, you know, they need to have to be able to do this direct measurement and they need to declare the actual costs. Here I put it some um, some classic examples, you could say, and some frequently asked questions from the beneficiary, again, to demonstrate the direct measurement. So, for example, it may be that in FP7, they were claiming energy and power as an indirect cost, but they can charge it in Horizon 2020, provided they can measure it with, for example, meters. So if they can allocate this per project, then it's fine. Then if they have administrative staff members doing accounting for the action, they can be charged to the action provided that they have timesheets and this is the usual practice of the beneficiary. Then if they have multi-purpose equipment used for several actions and activities, uh, you see that they need again to measure this usage, you know, so they cannot charge this depreciation as a percentage of the total capacity based on experience. So this is kind of linked to the to the previous example. So they would need to, to have some kind of logs to see for which actions they use the equipment. Here I also included some slides about uh, the definition of the conflict of interest. But uh, for the purpose of the CFS, you don't have procedures related to this. It's only a mention in the letter of a presentation that the beneficiary, they are saying that they didn't have the conflict of interest. This is also a slide to explain what the beneficiary needs to do in case that uh, they, they had conflict of interest, you know, so you see that they need to notify the, the commission or agency and they need to take the appropriate measures to, to rectify the situation. Now we go back to travel cost, which is the last um, the last topic of this presentation. So here is more or less the same approach as for the subcontracting and uh, equipment and so on when we are looking at the procurement. So first, if the beneficiary has an internal policy about travel, you are checking if they comply with that. If they don't have, you are looking at the usual practices for, for travel. Then you also need to check that the costs are necessary for the action. So here you will look at the travel cost with the list of stuff that they 
declared on the projects, you will look at the travel dates, you will compare them with the timesheets, with the project period, and you will look at the duration of the event to see if it makes sense with the period that they claim the cost for travel. You will look also at the justification about the necessity of this travel cost for the action. And also it makes sense to look at the annexes of the grant agreement to see if, you know, this travel was maybe meant to happen. Like if you find some very exotic trips, you know, you may wonder yourself if that was meant to happen. We also need to check that the travel costs are real. So for this, you will review minutes of meetings, attendance lists, the dates of traveling, again, compared to the timesheets, the justification for the link to the project, and again, the annexes and so on. So it's more or less the, the same procedures as before. We also need to check that the travel costs are uh, sound, are having you know, a sound financial management. So this, what does it mean for us? So normally no entertainment or hospitability cost should be declared that no tips and no travel agency fee should be declared unless there is a policy that they are using an agency, so then it's normal that they are claiming the agency fees. Also, no private cost should be claimed, like TV, laundry, mini bar, and, and so on. Okay, so this, this was the last slide of the presentation. I would like to thank you for your attention. My name is Georgie Bankos, and I was your host for this presentation. So thanks again, audit well, and okay, stay awesome. Hello, welcome back. So I hope you enjoyed the movie. Thank you for the colleagues from the control room who edited the three episodes. They made them a little bit shorter and uh, they make more sense together as a one longer movie. So thank you for that. So I'm back with uh, Xavier here for the questions. We have 32 questions and uh, understood we were around uh, three, 350 people online. So let's start with the questions then. So how do we do? You want to read the question here? Yeah. Read the question, Xavier, and then I will reply. Okay, perfect. So the, the most uh, famous question for now is uh, regarding uh, Horizon Europe. So when will the CFS be published uh, with uh, procedures as is the case in H2020, uh, which complies with the norm ISRS 4400? because the current does not meet standards. Okay, so thank you very much for the question. Indeed, that's a very good question. And it looks like we also identified more or less the person who raised this question because we also received a much more detailed question about this topic with very good points. So I understand that the colleagues are working on this template for uh, Horizon Europe for the CFS certificate because the current one is just a draft, let's say, or a, it's an initial version, but it's going to be updated soon. So I would expect, okay, during this year that we will have a much, much improved version, which also complies with um, the standard for um, agreed upon procedures. Okay, so let's see the next question. Okay, so the next question is kind of the same. We already uh, reply, I think, because uh, the question was when will the EU grant syndicative audit program uh, be uh, available? Ah, no, by the way, it's not about uh, the CFS, it's about the YAP. Yeah, yeah. So the indicative audit program for Horizon Europe, okay, we don't have any clear date, but we expect it's going to be available this year because uh, next year we will start to make audits for Horizon Europe. So we need to have it this year. Yes. Uh, OK, the next one is, so why is the Horizon Europe CFS model changed compared to the H2020 CFS model? Is it allowed to use the H2020 CFS model for Horizon Europe projects? Okay, so um, I don't know the details why it has been changed, but I understand that the current version that it's uh, applicable for Horizon Europe is going to be modified. 
So then uh, you will have a new one, but for the moment you are supposed to use what it is applicable for Horizon Europe. Okay, so again, uh, next question is about uh, Horizon Europe. So it seems to be a hot uh, topic. Uh, based on the terms of reference for Horizon Europe, is it allowed to check only one item per cost category? So, first of all, the question is not very clear, but as it is related to Horizon Europe, we will not reply to that now. Fair enough. Uh, next one, again, about Horizon Europe. I don't know if we should... Uh... So, again, as it is related to Horizon Europe, we will not reply, but as far as I understand, the, the annotations to the a grant agreement for Horizon Europe, they are uh, still work in progress, so you will have another version at a certain point for these annotations, which I expect that they will clarify all these points. Okay, great. So now next question about H 2020, which is the topic of today. Uh, how do you check for double funding? So as you you can see on the slides, the two double findings, you have the, the check for the hours and the check for the cost, you know. And then you need to ensure that overall for the hours, they didn't declare more hours than the productive time. And again, the eligible costs that they are not higher than the cost that you have in the accounting. So that's the simplified version. Okay, so next question, I guess it's about Euros and Europe. Will there be more audit procedures to be performed by the auditor because the current template is much shorter than the template in H2020. Yes, yeah, so this is what I would expect, that uh, more procedures will be added with more details and uh, the template will be updated to, to look probably closer to what it is now in Horizon 2020. Okay, the next question again about Eurasian Europe. In uh, Eurasian Europe, is the CFS prepared only at the end of the project or at each reporting period if the threshold has been reached before the end of the project? Yeah, so as it is Horizon Europe, we don't reply to that, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. So the next question is, okay, about the EC audit. So, uh, some, I guess it's a beneficiary was asking that. Do I have to follow the EC recommendations? Is there a legal basis or are these just recommendations, consequences of not following them, etc.? So, the point is that, okay, the recommendations that uh, you have in the EC audits, they are supposed to be, to be implemented. This is what's written in the letter of conclusion of the audit which is sent to you with the final audit report. But, uh, you know, so far, like say, I'm not really aware of cases when uh, the beneficiaries did not implement the recommendation. So I cannot comment too much on the consequences if you don't do it. And all the time, any recommendation should have a legal basis. That's a requirement from the quality control. Yes, indeed. Okay, so the next question is about the other direct cost. So, an invoice recorded during the project lifetime, but paid after the end of the project, is it eligible? Uh, yes, so basically if it was recording during the project lifetime, so it is in the accounting records in the good period, it doesn't matter that it was paid after the end of the project. Okay, then we have another question about the dinner. So are working dinner, no entertainment or hospitality in the course of consortium meetings eligible? What documents will be needed to be eligible, threshold, etc.? You know, this is a, it's a very good question and you could say it's a hot topic. My advice would be to avoid declaring such costs because they may be considered not eligible because they may be considered entertainment or hospitability, which are not eligible. And the point is that, you know, you are claiming this cost, but on the other side, the, the persons coming there from the consortium, they could also claim travel costs for the same dinner, you know. And okay, when we have an audit, we let's say we audit you, we don't audit the other people visiting you for 
these dinners and so on. So we expect that, you know, they got their travel costs. So in principle, you should not also kind of claim again the, the cost that they also incur. So I would say, okay, if you want to do this, fine, but don't don't claim it to the to the commission, to the granting authorities, if you want to to play it safe. Okay. So the next question is about personal cost. So if the productive time of one thousand seven hundred twenty hours is used, so that's option one for employees without a national collective contract, is it possible to report working time on weekends and holidays? So the point is that in general, uh, whatever productive time you are using, we don't expect you to declare cost in weekends and in holidays. So this, if you do it, it's most of the cases considered not eligible. And I would say uh, you should avoid it and uh, you should limit as much as possible. But if you do that, you should have very clear justification and approval. Because also here, like if I work in the weekend or during a holiday, I need to request approval from my boss, you know, if I can do that and then if he will agree to, to accept these hours, you know. So I would say we can accept this for our projects. Is also if you internally, you have some uh, special uh, approval that internally the beneficiary accepts these hours, you know, but we would expect that this is not common practice and it's very limited. Okay, uh, so next question is about, so an, in, an interim CFS was provided for the interim payment, okay. Expenditures covered by the CFS need to be re-audited. Could they refer to interim CFS for that period? So in um, Horizon 2020, in principle, you should just have a CFS at the end, you know, but if you decide to do it earlier at every period and so on, again, you should just say at the end, okay, the, the situation for the whole cost. So I, I'm not sure if from your question, you are saying that you had an auditor for the interim period and then is another auditor for the, for the second period and then, okay, they don't want to re-audit the cost, which it would make sense. But the point is that at the end, you should provide the CFS for the, for the, full, pe for the full period of the action. And then uh, it doesn't matter if the work, you know, was, uh, was provided, let's say, was done earlier, at an earlier stage for part of the periods of the project. Okay. Okay, next questions. I'm not sure maybe you will uh, get it. What about PhD students who have a fellowship? Yeah, yeah, like uh, I don't really understand like what's the question, like what about, yeah, like they exist and so on, but. Okay, maybe if the person who wrote this question can uh, detail a little bit more on Slido, so we can yeah. answer that. Uh, in the meantime, we can go to the next question. Uh, if public transport, bicycle allowance is part of the usual personal cost of the beneficiary, are they eligible as part of the personal cost in EU projects? Uh, yes, so if this is part of the usual um, cost accounting practices of the beneficiary, in principle, it should be also accepted for the um, cost in the EU projects. Okay, so next question is about okay, presentations in general. Uh, when will questions regarding CFS and Horizon Europe be replied to? Is there a seminar that will be organized shortly? So as far as I know, there were already some seminars organized about uh, Horizon Europe, but indeed it was not one of CFS yet, but I would say for sure those will be organized uh, after the template has been updated and so on. And that's a, that's a great idea. So thank you very much for the question and, and for the idea. <coughs> Okay, so next question is about clinical studies. How to check certified patient fees, which are paid or received not on actual cost, but on number of patients included in the clinical study? Yeah, I'm not so sure I totally understand the question, but the point is that, you know, if you have a fee and they are paid and so on, it should be based on some documents. So in the end, okay, 
you need to determine so which is the actual cost and you also have there like the number of patients which is, needs to be based on some other records you know to, to document which is the number of patients but yeah at this stage I cannot comment much more on that. Okay uh, next question is about the slides which is a classic question but always useful will they be available? Yes, of course. So the, the slides are available, like um, they are part of the announcements on the portal about this event. So there, if you go, you can access them in a PDF version. Okay. Okay, next question. So we go back to the topic. Uh, is the use of uh, reporting materiality of 150 euros allowed? That means that all differences bit below 150 will not be reported. So the point is that the template for the CFS for Horizon 2020 doesn't mention anything about reporting materiality and also in general the reporting materiality for our reports it is calculated as a percentage of the of the cost declared you know so it's not a fixed amount like you know sometimes you know 150 euros is more relevant than in others you know so those are my two cents on that. <laughs> Okay, next question is the following. The people rate calculation and the period over which <coughs> it needs to stay constant seems different between Edge 2020 and Horizon Europe. Um, Again, uh, about Horizon Europe. Yes, yeah, so, okay, we will not really reply to this, but indeed there are some differences and changes in Horizon Europe compared to Horizon 2020 and in principle it's going to be an impact in how the hourly rates are calculated. Okay, so next one is about co-found MSCA uh, actions. If a researcher has a sick leave covered, <coughs> by, the, covered by the social security, <coughs> the cost is lower than expected regarding the allowances, what should we do? The point is that the, the costs related to the Marie Curie projects, they are not part of the cost for which you require a CFS. So then, okay, this we will not reply because it's not related to the, to the CFS. Okay, fair enough. Uh, next question, it's a broad uh, question. <laughs> is it mandatory to hire an auditor? So if this is related, in fact, to who can perform the CFS, then you find the answer to this on the first slides in the presentation, where it is explained who can, uh, who can provide the CFS. Okay. Uh, okay, next one. Will the option to submit at final report a CFS per reporting period be kept in Horizon Europe? benefits of CFS per reporting period is that is audit closer to time of expenses? Okay, the question basically is, uh, is the CFS will be uh, the same? Yes, yeah, so this, okay, I prefer not to comment on this because, okay, it's about Horizon Europe, so that's another, another topic. Okay. Okay, next one is what, okay, next one is if, huh. okay, if we hire a person to the company, and project in September 22, we are to report in March 23, okay, so that's the context, which period we use to calculate hourly rate, four months from uh, 22, okay, good questions. Yeah, so basically here you have the, um, like, you know, you have parts of two years, 2022 and 2023. So first you do the calculation for 2022, which is going to be closed at the end of the reporting period. And for that, indeed, you have the cost only of four months, and then you will adjust your productive time to, to consider that you had only four months. And then, as uh, in March 2023, the period is not yet closed, you will apply the rule of the last closed financial year, and you will apply the rate that you use for 2022, also for 2023, at least the first part, so the first three months, because I would expect that you would have another period which is going to be maybe ending, you know, after 2023. So at a certain point, you will also have the, the rate for 2023, which you will start to use it uh, basically at a later stage. 
Okay, so next question is what about TNA cost? Are they not checked in the CFS? Uh, do you know what not TNA sure. means? Because no. I'm not I sure don't what know. TNA is. Yeah. If uh, the person who asked the question can uh, re ask and uh, saying that uh, in detail what TNA means, because we're not uh, yeah, I don't know. familiar don't with know. this. Okay, so we can go to the next question, which is about the alcoholic beverage in the course of working dinners. I guess the question is can we accept it? Yeah, so the point is that, you know, we already had the previous question about this type of expenses which they can com see com bleh, considered um, entertainment or hospitability, you know. And this, they are not eligible costs, you know. So then it's up to the auditor to decide if a certain expense is falling into that category or not. So in principle, I would advise you not to declare costs related to working dinners in the EU actions. Of course, you can do them, but okay, use your own budget for that. Okay, so next one uh, from Martin. So how to calculate the lifetime for depreciations of, the, of a 24-7 labor? Uh, so as an example, it puts uh, machines are available, could be used <coughs> all the time, only hours personal using the machine. Okay, so we're talking a uh, unique cost, I guess, here. Um, no, I think we talk about um, depreciation and there, as I was saying in the part about equipment, so there was a change at a certain point that we moved from uh, capacity to, to full usage, you know. So basically the, the beneficiary would need to keep records and document on what actions and what projects they are using the machine. And then, okay, you would do a split, you know, between the projects, like let's imagine that you use this thing on five projects, so then you would make a percentage how much was used on each project. But on the other side, also if the beneficiary has their own usual practice, uh, the auditor should also look at that and accept that, you know. So if you have a mo more prudent approach, that for example, you only claim the hours that the personnel has used this machine, so that should also be acceptable, you know. So. Okay, so next uh, question is, uh, okay, if a person works 100%, so total cost, as an example, total cost 1,000 euros at the institution, but only 50%, so 500 euros on the EU project, is the ceiling of the total personal cost the 100%, so the 1,000, or the 500 uh, euros? So here if we have in the, um, in the accounting, I understand we have 1,000 euros, so that's the, the cost of the person, so that's your threshold for the double ceiling, you know. Okay, so the next one is, does the auditor need to still include in the reports the adjusted cost as exceptions or remarks? Uh, <coughs> Okay, I guess. Mm, so here, um, as far as I understand, so most of the time, how does it work? Like the auditor goes, they uh, receive the, like what the beneficiary would like to declare. They do the audit work for the CFS and then they find some issues or some exceptions. And then many times the uh, beneficiary will adjust these errors to kind of remove all them before submitting the cost to the EC. But okay, if it's not working like that, that you know, like you still have these errors in what they want to declare, you should indeed, uh, you know, mention them as exceptions or um, remarks in the in the report, because then the people who are dealing with the payment for the project they can see this, and then they will uh, reject this cost when they do the payment. Okay, so next uh, we have. Uh Okay, but the financial support, so must the CFS check all procedures for financial support to third parties? So the point is that, okay, each section, it's only applicable when this situation is applicable. Like, okay, if you don't have a case of financial support to third parties, you don't need to, to perform any procedure. But if you need to perform them, yes. In principle, you need to perform all of them, or if you don't perform, you need to explain 
why certain procedure is not applicable or why you didn't perform it. Okay, thank you. So is, next question is, is a second man possible in case a person from a subsidiary, okay, EU subsidiary, so belonging to the group company, main beneficiary mm. would be another subsidiary. Okay, so I think we're talking about uh, income contributions here. Mm, the, uh, yeah, so it's possible. <laughs> yes, it's possible, but okay. You, you have a slide on that in the personal cost section, you know, with the rules and the checks and so on. So I would say, yes, that's possible. And then uh, you have there the procedures which you need to perform. Okay, next question is, uh, if we have to use previous year's productive hours to calculate the hourly rate, do we have to use also the previous year's productive hours for, okay, for the double, double selling check? So here, okay, so you have the, the rule of the last close financial year. So in, if you are into that situation, that's on the hourly rate. So it's telling you, okay, which is the hourly rate you should be using. But then for the actual checks for the double ceiling, you are using the, the actual data for that year, meaning that you are looking at the hours declared in that year with the, you know, pro, with the, okay, how many hours you declared in that year, and also you look at the cost in the accounting in that year, like, like the next year. So there it's a mix of things. Okay. Uh, okay, so next, can personal cost for preparing uh, final technical report and audit be claimed after the end of the project period? Yes, these are the, um, these are the only exceptions which they can be claimed after the end of the project period. Okay, uh, next is about the travel cost. What does hospitality cost mean? You know, this is quite a uh, philosophical question, let's say, you know, but uh, so here the auditor will need to, to apply his professional judgment, you know, to, to see if you have hospitability costs and so on. Okay, next is about US and Europe. So, okay. Uh, no, want to so, comment? no, the, like, you know, the rules are not exactly the same in the, in the two programs. So there are some differences. So be very careful about the differences. Right. Uh, next. Okay. So related to the PhD students question. Ah, okay. We have fellowships. So that was the question that we had. Ah, okay. We asked for more details. So related to the PhD students question who have fellowships. Are the cost eligible if they do not have a usual employee contract? So thank you very much for coming back with this question with the details. Now it's more clear. So the point is that indeed the cost for PhD students with fellowships may be eligible, but then they need to comply with certain criteria. And the main, the main criteria which we are looking at that is that we need to ensure that what they do is not basically a training related activity but it's it's more like a working activity you know so this is the the most important aspects which which the auditors are looking at the, at it okay uh, okay next questions covid okay so in the covid situation beneficiaries applied for short term work for the employees hours change each month Okay, how to deal with it in option one, except deduction, deduct the funding. Okay, here I'm not sure how to take these questions. I don't know if you... So, okay, the rules are the rules, you need to apply them, but if I, and it's like, you know, it depends a lot um, how, how did they implement this, because if I understand correctly, Maybe because they work less, like maybe your full-time equivalent, it's less, which means that you may be able to, to adjust your productive time based on that. 
in the sense that let's say if the employees they had worked you know 50 percent of the time and that was you know in the contracts and so on for a certain months then you can consider this reduction also in the productive time for those months so this will normally not affect the hourly rate too much you know but uh, it is yeah, it depends how this is documented and what exactly means short-term work you know but yeah okay thank you for that uh, question uh, when a travel activity occurs uh, in start of reporting period two but costs start appearing in end of reporting period one which reporting period should they be recorded and audited mm. <clears throat> so you know in uh, in the audits and in the accounting we are working most of the the case on this accrual basis you know so basically we need to know when you book the cost you know you know so if you already have the cost in period one then okay they are into period two uh, sorry, in period one, even though okay, the actual travel may take place later, you know, like let's imagine you buy a plane ticket in period one, but the flight takes place in period two. So then you should claim that in, in period one. Okay, so next question. If end date of the project is November 22, okay, audit in January 23, okay. Uh, should early rate be based on early rate of 2021 or calculated based on personal cost of 2022? So last close financial year. Yeah, that's a question about the last close financial year and it's a very good question and okay, also the example is very good. But I, you know, before replying to the question, it's funny that, you know, we reply questions. I would say quite quickly, but I see that the number of questions, it's increasing all the time. Like, Okay, so I was, you know, hoping we will be able to reply all the questions, but I see that, okay, as questions are continuing, I don't know if we will be able to do that. And I don't know how we are uh, with the official timing with the one hour of questions, but okay, let's reply to this amazing question. So, um, the rule is saying that if at the end of the reporting period, which in this case, it's, you know, 30 November 2020, the the year is not closed, which is the case. So then you need to use the rate of the previous year. So in this case, you need to use the rate of 2021. And all the time you need to bear in mind, like you need to look at the date, you know. So you don't need to see, okay, but now that I come for the audit in January, I have the data, I have the rates, but you need to ask this question, like it, 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 was it closed the year at the end of the reporting period? like? the 30 November and it was not, you know, so then you need to use the previous year the rate. Okay, so next one. Um, so what documents are required in case of cost for FSTP, the supporting documents for the cost incurred by the sub beneficiary or just checking the reporting? Okay, I'm not very sure what the acronym relates to, but uh, maybe it's about third parties. But financial, uh, financial support to third parties, I guess. Yeah, okay. The guy from the bay. No, so okay, you will need, of course, to ask uh, supporting documents also from the, from the third party. You cannot just rely on the, what the beneficiary is telling you. Okay, so next uh, question. Is uh, 1,720 productive hours, so the option one, uh, related to 40 contract hours per week? So if full time is 36 hours for beneficiary, is it allowed to use 30, ah, the pro data? Okay, uh, 36 mm -hmm. divided by 40 times uh, 1,720 hours. Yeah, that's a very good question. I didn't see this before and honestly, it's a very smart one. Uh, so the point is that the first option for the productive time, like the 70-20, is not related to a 40 hours country, but it's related to a full time equivalent. And then it depends up to the beneficiary what type of contracts do they have, you know. 
And uh, so you cannot modify this if you have less hours per week. But okay, what does this mean is that indeed, uh, you know, beneficiaries which, uh, let's say, they have uh, less than 40 hours per week, they don't really find interesting to, to use this option of 70, 20 hours per week. So this is I would say, interesting or attractive if you have eight hours per week most of the times, you know. Okay, so next, about uh, long-term sick leave. So it's stated, okay, parental leave can be deducted, but can, for example, a long-term sick leave also be deducted? Uh, I think here they are talking about uh, the productive time, no? I guess or, so, yes. Or the costs and... Yeah, exactly, in the productive hours calculation. Mm, yeah. So the point is that in the end, uh, you will need to, to determine in this case uh, which is the productive time, you know. And then, okay, you need to see, okay, which are the documents and how it was documented this time of long-term sick leave, you know. Because in the end, okay, we, we don't want to affect the hourly rate too much, but also we need to, you know, to, to come with some reasonable calculation, to put it like that. Okay, okay, next question is about the actual hours. So what happens if the actual hours worked is more than the 1,720 hours yearly rate? So, okay. So what happens is that um, if you don't apply the two double ceilings in this situation, basically you would start to make a profit, you know. So this is why you have the two double ceiling in place because you need to start to limit the hours declared on your projects to your productive time. So which in this case it's 70, 20. So you cannot declare more than 70, 20 hours on the EU project because if not, you will have also more costs declared than what you have in your accounting. So that's not, that's not allowed. So this is why we have the two ceilings in place. Okay, so next uh, question is about, okay, um, broadly the CFA, so about the auditors. Mm -hmm. So the public bodies may use an independent public officer with formal competence to audit. Okay, right. What to pay attention to to avoid a conflict of interest? So the thing is that, yes, this is one of the accepted exceptions. So you can do that and then, uh, okay, I would say the internal auditors, you know, they know very well about conflict of interest and so on, and they will make the, the correct required paperwork in this case to, to ensure that, okay, the potential conflict of interest is minimized. Okay, so next one mm. is about, okay, if a if the employee records over 1,720 hours on their time sheets, we kept the amount of hours reported for claim. However, can we report the actual PM efforts? Okay, so we're we talking about somebody who works more than the option one selected. Yeah, so indeed you need to, to limit the hours declared so that you are not going over the costs, but then in the, I, I guess it's about the project management report. I think it's better to report the actual ref effort. Okay, so next question. Okay, so we have, uh, we got the TNA. Thank you for, uh, <laughs> for detailing this. So TNA means transnational access, okay. So the question was, are they uh, not checking the CFS? Uh, this I'm not sure, we need to check, but I, I don't think so, because it's not very common. Okay, okay, so we can jump to the next one uh, about the threshold. So is the threshold for the particip participant plus its third party or apply for each one separately? Oh, okay, so can you, do you, should you <coughs> gather the amounts for both or? It separately. Mm, so you need to take it separately because they, uh, you know, they submit separate form C. So then, this is why they are separately. 
understandable, yes. Uh, okay, next. A uh, critical issue is SME owners without salary. Okay, yes. In some EU countries, SME owners can sign employment contracts. Yes, that's uh, true. <laughs> is then, that's a hot topic indeed. Is then, by definition, their high cost eligible? Okay, so let's let's not generalize that. Okay, the these employment costs they are high in general, but indeed uh, there are situations when uh, SME owners they have employment contracts, and if you know that's that's fine. Okay, then those high eligible costs, like those high costs, will be eligible. Okay. Uh, so next one about travel costs. So if a beneficiary has a travel allowance system, so the per diem, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, can it be used for the EU project instead of declaring actual expenses? Oh, okay. So. <coughs> yeah, so if that's their uh, usual practice, um, it's also fine for us. Indeed, uh, it's uh, very, very usual. Uh, I think that was <coughs> in audit. Okay, so next one. Uh, okay, about COVID, so at COVID, uh, there was national funding for employees who reduced hours, funding it changed each month depending on actual number of hours worked, impact on option one. Okay, so this might be related to the question we had on the, on the COVID. I'm not sure I'm getting the whole context here. So I think, okay, they are saying that they work less, so they they work less, and of course they got less money also. Okay. That's also normal. And they are asking if they can modify the productive time, basically to reduce it, in order, you see, that the hourly rate is not affected, but... Uh, in the end, so this depends if you have, I would say, amendments to these contracts to say that, look, in this month, your uh, your full-time employee is different, you know. So if you have that, then you can modify, you know, the, the option one. Because for the option one, you can modify the number if the person didn't work for the full year with you or um, if they worked not at... 100% of the full-time equivalent. So, for example, if they worked at 50%, you would also use 50%. Okay, so next uh, questions. Okay, about how we take uh, the criterion of uh, for the consultants that are obliged to work at the beneficiary premises. So, under the ECO audit, so us, uh, <laughs> Are we uh, very strictly applying this criterion of uh, being obliged on the premises for the consultants? Um, so, okay. Uh, you know, of course, on one side, I would like to say we are very strictly applying. On the other side, I cannot tell you that we are not very strictly applying it. But in the end, that's not the point of the matter. Because the point is that in the end, with the current wording in the um, Horizon 2020, the emphasis is not so much to work on the premises of the beneficiary, but the emphasis is that they should have the same, uh, let's say, working approach or working standards as the employees, you know. So if they can work from another place, that's fine, you know. If the employees can also work from another place, that's fine. So in the end, the auditors, they need to ensure this kind of let's put it like that, equal treatment between the consultants and the employees, you know. So this is what we are really looking it at, you know. So we are, we will not penalize if somebody is not working on the premises, if that's allowed also for the employees. Okay. Uh, next question, which is a good question. I think uh, if additional remuneration is paid to somebody mm. based on... Uh, arbitrary method, okay, so nothing uh, behind this. Uh, but only the basic salary is charged to the EU project, would that be acceptable? Oh, yes, but um, 
I think you need to bear in mind that the definition of this uh, additional remuneration was changed at a certain point, because now you need to decide, look, are you in a situation of project-based remuneration or not project-based remuneration? And then the concept of additional remuneration, it's only applicable to project-based remuneration and it's eligible only if you are an... Uh, let's say, non-for-profit organization, you know. I see that it's a lot of people moving here around in the studio, so I'm not sure how we are with the timing and so on, if somebody needs to come back to take our place, let's say. Okay, so I think we can move to the next uh, question. Uh, so that would be, if there was an EC audit on interim reporting periods, okay. Does that mean by definition that the CFS should only cover the other letter reporting periods? Okay, yes, good question. <clears throat> yes, that's a good question and this is also um, clarified in the letter of uh, conclusion of the audits, you know, which is telling you that what was audited by the EC audits, it needs to be removed in from the threshold for the CFS. So it may be that probably you don't even need the CFS anymore at the end because if you deduct from the thresholds how much was already audited by the EC audit, then probably you are below the threshold. Okay, yes, that's clear. Uh, okay, next question, which is a broad question. So can you explain, please, the parental leave by monthly early rates? Uh, I could, but I would not do it because, in fact, I would uh, advise you to look in the annotated model grant agreement because you have an uh, example on this, you know, which is very good, it's very detailed, and in the end it's also quite complicated and time-consuming. So I, I would prefer not to, to enter into this topic now. Okay, yes, fair enough. So, uh, so check the annotations. Okay, next... Uh, would you accept a shortened useful life on equipment assets, or better say that the respective depression cost, yes, okay, in case the beneficiary mm -hmm. internal rules allow this? Okay, that's uh, particular. Well, the thing is that, you know, in the end, if the assessment of the auditor is that, you know, the beneficiary used the correct useful life, which is maybe, okay, shortened but I don't know exactly to what and it's acceptable so that that's fine you know because for example in uh, many countries uh, for the assets you have a range they say look you can depreciate this between five to three years so then okay if it's in the thing it's fine if you are below the three years then okay you would need some explanations or some justifications you know Okay, yes, so next question is, okay, the cost of the CFS are eligible, yes. Are they included as part of the final financial report of the action? Yes, so the cost of the CFS are eligible, but only at the end of the action, you know, and you can include them, of course, in the, in the costs. Okay, next question. Question is about okay due to a cyber attack okay so yeah that can happen unfortunately a beneficiary lost part of its uh, supporting documentation for internal invoices how to deal with this taking into account that no restoration can be uh, done yes yeah, so uh, I'm afraid that you would need to consider those costs eligible uh, sorry not eligible. Because, okay, if you don't have documents, you cannot accept the costs like that. So I don't see other uh, better option. Okay. Uh, next question. Is the EC checking that the firm signing off the CFS is effectively meeting the EC Directive 2006-43 EC on statutory audits? Example... Uh, content auditor thing, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure about that in the sense that, okay, we are not dealing with that ourselves. You know, we are the ones doing the audits and reviewing the audits made by the external audit firms. 
but I would expect that you know the financial officer when they receive the payment request and if they receive the CFS and they can see okay who is the auditor maybe they check or on at least a sample basis you know if the if the auditors you know they were fulfilling this criteria but I'm not sure like I don't know exactly what the financial it's auditor like you know what the financial officer is doing when they accept or not a CFS certificate. And in any case, you should be uh, following this uh, directive. Yes, it, it should shouldn't be, be but, uh, a question. Uh, anyway. But I don't know if we are really checking that. Okay, so next question. What will happen if we change the option of productive hours when auditing a project that has been reported before with the old option? Ah, okay, so changing because there is an audit or... I know they're reporting one option, and then I think the we is uh, the beneficiary modified the option, but it's already been reported. So the point is that okay, the the auditors they will audit what it was reported and they will determine what's eligible, and then about changes of productive hours or productive time, so that's acceptable but you need to do it you know consistently and systematically starting for a full calendar year or for a full product you know fiscal year so you cannot just do that in the middle of the year you know so i would say if you follow that it's fine but if not and okay in the audit they will need to to consider what was already declared what was reported okay uh, okay, next question. In the former, okay, FAQ, okay, there was an answer that the CFS cost could be declared within the personal cost made by an, an internal independent public officer. Still okay? Uh, okay, that's uh, particular. You know, so in principle, okay, the the CFS cost should be declared under other direct cost as a, as a service. But indeed, that's a very interesting thing because here I understand that probably there is no external cost because it's the independent public office officer. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess yeah, that's that's something which. I will need to look into it because, okay, that's not, yeah, the classic personal cost of the project, you know. So I would expect that it's more in the, in the other direct cost, but uh, it's part of the internal invoicing approach. Okay. So this is where I would put it. I would still say that it should be an other direct cost, not a personal cost. And then how you determine the amount, you know, they should see what is the procedure for the internal invoices for, for this type of service. So this is how I, I would see it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Okay. Okay, we're talking here about uh, link to the action, I guess, because are translations cost eligible and investment cost, for example, sc school kitchen equipment? I don't know, like, I know, the question is quite wide. Like, you know, I would say in certain cases, translations maybe, they would be eligible if probably that's exactly the, the purpose of the action, the purpose of the projects. But then, uh, okay, I'm not so sure what do they want to say with the investment cost. Like, okay, if it's again part of the scope of the project and it's part of the durable equipment, then it's fine. If not, it's not. But uh, I guess here you need to look a lot like what's the description of the project and what they are supposed to do and what you have in Annex 1, what's the explanation of the equipment there and so on. Yes. Okay. So next uh, question. If we use the salary from the previous year to calculate the early rate, which salary do we use? to check the double ceiling, previous or actual? So you will do your calculation using the, like, you know, 
you will do your calculation to declare what it, you want to declare by applying the uh, rule of the previous financial year. So you will declare something. But then in the accounting, you will have the actual cost for that year. So when you look at the double ceiling, you will look at the actual cost of the actual year, you know, and also at the actual hours declared and so on. But in the end, you will include for part of the year, you know, what it was declared in this check by the application of the last close financial year. So maybe now it sounds more confusing that it is really it is, but okay. It's easier in practice, let's say. Okay, so next one. Uh, are certification cost eligible both, okay, both in the case of uh, certification provided at the interim report and also at the final report? <coughs> yeah, it's funny that this doesn't have any like, but <laughs> it's still, yeah, okay. So the thing is that the rule is saying that it's eligible only the cost of the final report, but kind of you need to say, look, it costed me, let's say, 5,000 euros, but this is not more than what I paid because, uh, you know, I did it for each period, you know. So in the end, the financial officer needs to know which would have been the cost for the CFS if it would have been provided just at the end, you know. So that's the eligible part. And then if you paid more because they did more work, because they audited, you know, also the interim periods, that's not eligible. Okay, that's uh, quite clear. Uh, next question. So we have another example of uh, how to, to deal with this uh, last uh, close financial year. So here the example. Uh, what if the last close financial year does not include 12 months of, of employment, but only uh, as an example, four months of employment? How do we, how do we deal with this? Yeah, so as explained before to the other question, like if the previous year it's not having 12 months, there's not a problem, you still need to calculate the rate and you would take the cost for that period and you would adjust the productive time. So in this case, if the time it's only four months, you will adjust the productive time to consider it's only for, um, for four months. And then, okay, full financial year mean like, you know, like it needs to be, you know, normally 12 months, like, you know, January to December or, you know, April to May, depends which is your uh, financial or fiscal year, you know. So this is what it means that if you are not at the end of this stuff, you know. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, can, okay, long-term sick again. So <laughs> can a long-term sick leave also be detected when a beneficiary uses option C, so I guess this is option uh, three here. Ah, no, okay, sorry. Yeah. Ah, okay, now we're good. Uh, so, can a long-term sick leave also be detected when a beneficiary uses option C for productive hours? Option uh, three, I guess. So, standard. Um, no, so the thing is that, you know, you have these options and, okay, the beauty of it is that all the time you have some advantages and disadvantages, you know, but if you are going for the standard productive hours, then okay, you cannot uh, really play with them, you know. So then you, I would say, you still need to use uh, your standard productive time and just to, to amend it with the, with the usual changes, you know. Okay, so next uh, question is, uh, okay, so this one we already replied, I think, uh, but the second yes. one. Yes. Okay, this one. So you stated that unit cost, in our case, for additional activities are similar to lump sums. Uh, okay, I don't know who stated that, but uh, let's uh, keep it. To what extent are quantitative records required to justify them? So first of all, okay, I don't know where it's coming, this statement that unit costs are similar to lump sums because that's clear, not the case. And then, okay, for the unit cost, you know, you have the, the two options. Like 
the ones set up by the Commission, which is the, for example, the Marie Curie rates, and then you have the unit cost based on the usual practice, which it's mostly used by big uh, beneficiaries with a lot of projects and, and so on. But in the end, uh, okay, we need to audit this unit cost, you know, so uh, they need to be based, okay, on some kind of actual cost, and uh, there is a more complicated process on that. But, uh, you know, the short answer is that, okay, you cannot just take you would say uh, the declaration of the or the word of the beneficiary saying that's my unit cost this is what i used just accept it you know so you need to go back at the details of that you know so what's the calculation behind you know is it fine is it eligible and so on okay so uh, the next question uh, is okay, so we can, uh, yes, will the presentation be accessible and uh, under which uh, link after the uh, webinar? So this, okay, uh, I guess is gonna be posted, okay, the link and so on. Okay. So we'll see. Uh, next question. Ah, but the best value for money, okay, this is a good one. How do you, how do you check uh, the principle of best value for money when the beneficiary does not have any procurement policy in place? So you need to, to ask them, okay, so how they can demonstrate to you that they ensure the, the best value for money principle. Because, okay, maybe they don't have any procurement policy, but maybe they have an usual practice or uh, it should be something. And if, if not, they need to show you, so what did they do? Because then I would say, a normal person, a, a same beneficiary, would not just go to to spend the money like that. So before spending the money, you should still check somehow that, okay, you want to pay the less as possible for the service that you need, you know. So in that case, <clears throat> probably the auditor will ask the beneficiary, okay, give me what you have, and then the auditor will see if that's acceptable or not, if they believe that, okay, the best value for money was achieved or not. Okay, uh, next uh, question is, okay, it's about uh, Horizon Europe. I don't think uh, we will... Uh, no, we will. We will treat this one. So the next question then is about uh, personal costs. So are personal costs kept constant during the organization's mm. fiscal year? Uh, Okay. You know, this I guess it's up to the um, to the beneficiary. You know, it depends how much they they pay the people and so on. If they increase the salaries or if they decrease the salaries and, and so on. But uh, no, so in the end, this can this can change during the year. Okay. Uh, next uh, questions about okay the timeline uh, on the CFS. So when is the CFS due? at the end of the project period or after every reporting period? So it is due at the end of the reporting period, the, of the end of the project period. Okay, that's, that's clear. Uh, so what happens if the actual work hours recording on TS? Timesheets. Timesheets, okay, yes. Thank you. <laughs> is more than the cat uh, predictive hours of uh, option one, so 1,720 hours. So in that case, you need to apply the, um, the two double ceilings. So first you will need to cap the hours to declare to 7020 so that you don't declare more costs than what you have basically in your accounting. So, so you need to apply the two ceilings. Okay, yes, clear, so double ceiling. Uh, next question is, uh, okay, so are the rules around the CFS applicable to the SMP as well? Okay, SMP, I don't know if you have this. Um, I don't know what it is. Uh, SMP, okay, if the person who asked this question can detail uh, I guess they all left because there are no more uh, new questions, which is good. <laughs> uh, 
But okay, so better luck next time. Okay, yes. Uh, okay, so next question. The CFS is mandatory once above the threshold. Yes, indeed. An issue audit will be always done in the projects that have gone under a CFS. Ah. Uh, no, so so you will not have an easy audit all the times for the projects where a CFS was made. But okay, I'm not sure what was said there. Like that have gone under a CFS because maybe they want to say if you are below the threshold, if you if you would have an easy audit. So that's also not uh, a direct thing. So you know, most of the projects they are not audited, or they don't have a CFS. You know, because you have the threshold, and okay, we cannot audit all the projects. Huh? So we just audit some of them. Okay. So uh, next question: What's your recommendation to us if we are thinking to change option of productive hours from one to option three? Yeah. Now I saw uh, okay the clarification with the SMP single market program, with the previous question. So I would say yeah, if it's not Horizon 2020, we will uh, like the CFS is not applicable to that because it's not Horizon 2020 program. Okay, so let's go back yes to the this question with the recommendation. So I would say if you want to do this, think very well because, okay, to use option three is more complicated or is more risky. And um, you need to ensure that when you do this change, so you do it consistently in all the projects and not just the Horizon 2020 projects, like it needs to be used also in other projects, you know. So this is something which is not totally understood many times. And at least in the EC audits, we are looking to see that you apply this thing also not in the Horizon 2020 projects, but also in other type of projects. And if you don't do that, then we will fall back to option one or option two. You know, and again, so let's imagine you do the change in all the projects, but again, you need to do it, you know, from the beginning of a year, like to say, look for 2023 or okay, let's say next year, 2024, in all the projects we do this, you know. So you cannot just do it at the mid of the year or something like that. Okay, uh, next question. And I think that's the last one because there is a couple, but uh, the second is not related to us, I think. Okay, so from Maria, still, okay, on the best value for money principle, if uh, the beneficiary do not provide us any further documentation, a cost already incurred in 2017, would you reject the cost? Yes. Yes, I would reject the cost. <laughs> yes, so if you don't have documents, you don't have other option than to reject the cost, yeah. Okay, so I would. think... Um... So that's all. We replied all the questions. We survived. I hope you enjoyed the movie. I see our studio man is also happy there, so thanks a lot. And uh, I guess we can close this and uh, go to lunch. Okay, thank you everybody and uh, see you to the next uh, Q&A session then. Oh, okay, bye. bye.